On that normal circumstances, every individual has a chamber or a cavity, that is the mouth, the pharynx, and the nose where sound are resonating in order to bring out a quality and a normal balance sound quality in an individual. But when there's any change in the size or shape of this chamber, i.e. the cavity in which the sound vibrates, this results in change in resonance. With the cleft palate population, the presence of a hole between the oral and the nasal cavity will increase the size of this chamber that resonates the, the, the air within the cavity and result in a change in the quality of the sound being produced due to demand on the velopharyngeal system, either due to inadequacy or insufficiency. What is a resonance? We are going to be discussing about resonance. What is a resonance? A resonance is said to be a sound energy vibration, said to be a sound energy vibration in the oral cavity, the pharynx, and then the nasal cavity, according to Puma and Lee, 1996. It is usually influenced by the size, surface, and shape of the structure, as Eliot said. This resonance is usually used to describe the perceptual as well as a physical attribute of speech. A normal resonance, the resonance is said to be balanced when the sound is heard only in the pharynx and then the nasal cavity and the oral cavity, which is primarily during the vowel and the vocalic voice consonant production. A normal resonance is said to be dependent on an adequate closure of the velopharyngeal ports. And I get a mother's father's screamer. A resonance is a speech parameter that has a range of acceptability and is rated or perceived along the continent. What I simply mean here is that according to the research, individual may have a familiar tendency for a change in resonance. In other parts of the world, some people may be nasal, which is normal, even when they don't have any clefting or any other thing. So by way of definition, this lack of velopharyngeal closed door as said, which is very important to have a very qualitative sound produced. In cleft palate population, the hole in between allows coupling of air between the nasal and the oral cavity due to inability to maintain a complete separation between the oral and the nasal cavity during the uh, resonance. Hello, Amina. This is a picture of a Hello, Amina. Could you could you slow down a bit? The the, the participants want to get, hear you more clearly. Can you hear me very well? Yeah. Yes, just slow down a bit. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And please, there is also a black bar. On no. Hello. Thank you, sir, for noticing. Yes, I was trying. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. It's removed now. Please, you can go on, please. Okay. Amina, please. Go on. Can I continue? Speaking? Yeah, you can speak now. The bar has been removed. Hello, Amina. Amina. Hello, please, we can't hear you. I think we've lost stamina. Uh, let's just give us some few minutes to connect. Is 
Hello, Amina, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Please proceed Thank with you. your presentation. Okay, ma. Thank you. Okay. I said we have different type of resonance shift of deviation. The most dominant one being the hypertensibility, which is excessive to incomplete development. That is in order to become nasalized. That is saying the bar sound sound like the end, the end sound, an individual sound like he or she is talking through the nose. This severity of hypernasality in a speech patient or in a cleft palate patient is usually dependent on the etiology, articulation, or size of the fistula present. Hypernasality also is assessed on those patients using three major methods. The first is listening. When assessing for a child with hypernasality, we use the, th the three major cue for assessment, which is listening, which is said to be an acoustic method. While you listen, you, you prompt the child for his... You prompt the child to say something by placing the hand on the side of the nose so that you can feel the nasal booze. Under normal circumstances, for oral sound, there's not supposed to be a nasal vibration. So the third one is... Can you hear me? Hello? A cul-de-sac testing is usually done in order to different... Divine intervention, the HDK9 presentation. Moderate severe. Is it a distracting feature of speech? Is it mildly distracting or is it an overriding feature of the speech? This picture is trying to show the air passage from the pharynx causing increase or excessive air into the nasal cavity resulting in the hypernasal sound that the child produced during speech assessment. Hyponasality. This is the second nasal consonants, which are the M, the N, and the NG, making them similar to the DA and the GA sound. Usually, this speech, the nasal airway itself is being completely or partially blocked, either in congestion, enlarged toes, stenotic nariz, Maxillary retrusion, maybe sometimes habitual, that is congestion or significant. The child speaks as if he has a common cold. This is of happening. 
console and target are usually in the So one of the most important patient with hyper should understand that this time the laser gel pots. So unless when the symptoms have been removed or cleared, that is when the vela function as she should not make the wrong judgment of knowing or regarding the veloparyngeal adequacy. Resonance may also be present in cases of apraxia of speech. This is because the vela do not lower fast enough for nasal sound to be made after it has risen for the oral sound. That has to do with the coordination and movement of the vela for closed door, which affects the timing how the veloparyngeal gets closed. When we are assessing patients with hyponasality, we usually assess them using either single word or sentences loaded with a nasal sound. Also, hyponasality can be scored just as hyponasality, meaning it might be mild, severe, maybe a distracting feature of speech, or it's an overriding feature of speech. The next one is mixed nasality. Mixed nasality is a speech resonance shift, which is characterized by elements of both hyper and hyponasality. That is according to Peterson 2001. It is usually a result of incomplete veloparyngeal closure in the presence of high nasal resistance, i.e. the congestion, a large adenoid, a large tonsils which is not sufficient to completely block the nasal airway. The dominant resonance shift here in mixed nasality is usually hypernasality. When making assessment, you assess for hyper in the oral sound, while you assess for hypo in the nasal sound. According to Kuma, this resonance does not eliminate nasal resonance on vowel or consonants. Assessment usually is made with combination of sound, that is both nasal and oral sound in, in combined sentences or repetitive word. How the suck resonance? This is also a variation of hypernasality, which differs only in place of obstruction and its impact on speech. It is when the resonance actually resonated around an obstruction landing in the pharynx or in the nasal cavity. It is usually described as a muffled sound, according to Morris, of a tattoo in the mouth sound because the sound is usually trapped in an inlet without an outlet for, him, for going out. And this type of resonance is usually noted in individuals who has a larger tonsils or adenoid pad. According to Puma, he explained that this tissue trapped the air, causing the sound energy to resonate in the pharynx. Usually an individual with a cold sac resonance, the sound, the volume tends to be very low and the speech sound like a mumbling sound, as if the individual is trying to say sound through a smaller opening. After knowing this, we are supposed to know how to assess the resonance in a postpartum cleft patients. Usually in assessment, we talk about having speech sound or samples so that we can evaluate and analyze our speech samples so that we can be able to know the error type and the error pattern. So when we are assessing this patient, listening to a spontaneous speech has the greatest validity for judging resonance because of the demand on the veloparyngeal port system to achieve and maintain closed door. It can be difficult to separate all the speech symptoms of veloparyngeal functioning during conversational speech, so a more focused evaluation is often conducted. That is what is called the auditory perceptual evaluation. When we are assessing, we are now assessing patient based on age, developmental milestone, because in order to avoid age-appropriate error. For patients with hypernasality, 
based on the age, as I said, you can ask the child to slowly recite the letter of alphabets. You listen to the vowel sound. You feel the nasal bridge at the side of the nose for vibration. You then occlude the nariz. If there is more nasality on the B, the C, and the D sound, then the letter of the F, the J, and the last sound when the child is naming the alphabets, this indicates a questionable palatal function. Other sample we can use for the child based on age may be the combination of oral nasal pair. Like you can say the bit, meat, bat, mat, bite, might, boots, and moot. Others that can be used. Other sentences that can be used is the use of high tense vowel. The high tense vowel production, that is the E and the O sound, which is very important in hypernasality. You can use it in a single word, like from the child to E, rule, or E. Hello? Can you hear me? You can use also sentences with oral consonants. Such sentences can be broken down based on of the child. Other sentences used with oral consonants such as from the child to say, buy baby a beep, pat the happy puppy, tell Teddy to try harder, do it for daddy, go get the wagon, broken down. Like maybe say, buy baby a beep, pat the happy puppy. These are all sentences that can Hello, I Amina, mean, are you there? I think we've lost time in there. Just give us one second again. Hello, Amin, are you back? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Your, your, your network is fluctuating. Okay, ma'am. I said assessment of hypernasality using speech sample. So I'm waiting for the slide to be shown on the screen. Thank you, ma'am. Hypernasality usually are assessed using sound with only nasal sound, low pressure sound with a vowel sound. 
I said we can use the nasal pair when we are assessing. We can use a nasal pair when assessing, like saying the beat, meat, the neat, the mate, the nate, the might, and then the night. Or a single word as seen, asking the child to say moon, name, long, hand, and ring. Other sentences may be used based on the age of the child, like nanas, banana, lemon jam, Nancy is a nighttime nurse, mama made a lemon jam. The child can also be asked to do some counting, maybe one to 10, or from 90 to 99. All can be used to assess for hyponasality in the speech assessment. Assessing the patient for mixed nasality. As I said earlier, the mixed nasality is a type of resonance that I said is being characterized by elements of both hypernasality and hyponasality in the same speaker. So when you are now assessing, a combination of sentences, including both the oral and the nasal consonant are used to formulate a sentence. Based on the child age, these sentences can be broken into simpler ones, either in repetitive or in a single one. You can prompt the child to say, the green string bean jump from the can. Maybe the baby might come home now. The bunny came for my money. This sentence contains both nasal and oral consonants. So you had hypernasality in the oral sound, in the oral consonant, and you can get hypernasality in the nasal sound. Either the child can be prompted to say some repetitive words like green, bean, green, bean, Maybe, baby, maybe, baby, bunny, money. The overall assessment of a resonance shift, the resonance scale is usually scored as, depending on the type of facility, there are different type of score. But here we are going to use the most simplest type of score, which is balance, meaning there is no any shift of resonance, no presence of hypernasality, hypernasality, cul de sac, or mixed resonance. Mild is element of resonance shift, either hyper or hypo, called the self or mixed nasality. When it is moderate, meaning there is a moderate or distracting distraction to the speech sound, either both in order, whether it is hyper, hypo, or mixed nasality, or it can be severe, where it is an overriding feature of the speech, that interpretation is needed at all the time. So we can say mild, moderate, and severe. Usually when we are assessing, the cul-de-sac resonance usually, we can only access the child, maybe probing the child to say sound like me, 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 no, 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 because I said, in the cul-de-sac resonance, usually the, the, the sound are being trapped. They are trapped within the cavity due to obstruction or the large tonsillar part. As such, the individual sound like a mobbling. So when you are asking to repeat the, mm, 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 the child will be saying things like as if it's a mumbling those no, no sound out. What is the goal of assessment? For every speech therapist, the goal of assessment after collecting all the auditory perceptual evaluation assessment, the speech sample, either not only resonance, maybe the consonant strength, the, 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 the breath strength, the length of utterance of the sound, the nasal air emission, the articulator, the, uh, the articulation, and every other thing. The goal of assessing either the resonance or all the speech sound in palate patient is to determine which symptoms are due to physical limitation, which may require physical or surgical management, meaning the child will have to be referred back to the surgeon for evaluation. Or is it a learner pattern? and require speech therapy, that is where the speech therapy comes into action. All these are done to help you make an accurate prognosis of what the speech therapy is going to be like. That is the essence of making the resonance assessment. We have therapy techniques for eliminating the most dominant feature of cleft speech error, which is hypernasality. For effective speech therapy to eliminate or improve resonance in cleft patients, the therapist needs to understand the following limitation. 
That is, speech therapy cannot change hypernasality due to abnormal structure, even if the gap is small. And speech therapy is not usually effective in improving nasality due to abnormal physiology when there's velopharyngeal insufficiency. The therapy technique is only appropriate if individuals demonstrate the following features. One, compensatory articulation production secondary to velopharyngeal insufficiency. Misarticulation that causes hypernasality that is foreign specific. Hypernasality of This is because changing the structure does not change the function. Tell velopharyngeal functional organ through valve functional organ through auditory feedback. What I mean here is that when the child cleft palate is repaired, no matter how qualitative the repair is, I said correcting the structure do not actually correct the function. The child needs to learn how to use the organ functionally in order to make, to make a good speech sound. So it's just like the guitar metaphor we are told or the iPad metaphor. The surgeon gives you a good repair while the therapist now teach the child to push the button on how to use it. That is, the therapist now teach the child on how to use the guitar, the, the button on the guitar so that he can be able to play the guitar very well, or the iPad that is given to a child. He has the iPad, but he doesn't know how to press the button and get the, the keyword. So that is what it means by repairing the structure does not change the function. The function needs to be taught by the child so that the child can be able to use it. Here are some treatment plan according to the hierarchy of treatment. The best treatment plan starts with discrimination. And this discrimination is very, very important because that is when the child will be able to understand where are those sounds being made. How is he main, making the wrong sound? Or why is his sound not coming out clearly? So the use of the clown will tell the child whether the sound is made from the throat, is it coming directly from the mouth, or is it coming from the nose? The discrimination can be enhanced by using other things, like using a listening tube or a straw to increase awareness. This listening tube or straw is usually placed one at the entrance of the nose of the child, while the order can be placed on the air of the child so that when you prompt the child to say the sound, the sound will be louder, higher speech and high pitch between normal versus abnormal so that he can be able to adjust. Also, the use of a sound clip containing normal versus abnormal sound could also be used where the child can hear the normal sound and listen to his sound, which is said to be nasalized so that he can be able to compare. The nasal plug-in, i.e. the nose plug, is used to eliminate hypernasality or improve hypernasality. That is, using the nares closed versus nares open in prompting the child to say sound, like prolong e with the sound with the nares closed and with the nares open. All the sentences, all the sound, targeted sound can be used with the nose closed, when the child said it with the nose open, the nose can now be plugged so that the child can say it and there will be improvement. But it takes time, but it works actually. Then the use of phonological approach in any form of correction, especially of misarticulation, which is usually faster when you, when you use a phonological order. This means you are trying to determine the category of sound, which needs to be targeted first. You have to target a sound which is more stimulable to the child and the sound that have the biggest impact on the intelligibility of speech. Usually, according to the English speaker, the S sound is the more intelligible sound, more used sound in English. So more of the distortion, when it, there is a distortion in the S sound, we found that the intelligibility is also impaired. When we are treating this child, we all usually begin with anterior sound because they are more visible. The anterior sound are sound like the pa, the ba, the t, the da, the S and the, the Z sound, they are more anterior. So they are more easy to get at first. And when we are doing that, we have to start with the voice legs before the voice. Why? Because when you are starting with the voice, you are putting more pressure on the velopharyngeal port. But when you start with the voice legs, it went smoothly so that the child 
can learn easy, you start with a voiceless sound that doesn't have a lot of pressure, you move by adding voice into the sound. Others you can use. The mirror is also important too, in cases of misarticulation in a learned pattern, so that the child can be able to see how the therapist produces the sound and the place of articulation. We have also, this is the clown I use for discrimination, usually trying to show the child which sound is the throat sound, which sound is the mouth sound, and which sound is the nasal sound, so that the child can be able to know that when I say the sound, okay, this sound is coming from the mouth, or coming from the nose. The most important thing is for the child to be able to identify the parts of the body, understand them so that you can be able to identify them when you are trying to teach you. One thing I didn't mention here is, is how to distinguish between hypernasality and hyponasality, which is referred to as a Kuma test. When assessing the child, you are trying to differentiate whether it's hypernasality or it's hyponasality. Usually, when you prompt the child to say certain sound, like in hypernasality, according to the Kuma test, the B sound will be sounding like the M sound. Assuming you want to say for the baby, by baby A, by this baby, the child by say, my mommy and my. Meaning, the, the B is now sounding like the M sound. That is hypernasal. But when the M sound is now sound, the M is now sounding like the B sound, that is hypernasal. So you can prove the child to say the sentence, and when you find that the two things cannot be distinguishable, the oral and the nasal, then that is hyponasality, according to the Kuma sound, Kuma test. So, thank you for listening, thank you for bearing with me, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amina. Um, it seems like uh, Professor Ademokoya has dropped off. Um, it was a great presentation, yes. despite the technical challenges we believe is from the network. Um, Thank you. I have a couple of questions for you, uh, one of which is okay. example of the words or sentences Practicable, practicable in this environment like Kano. Okay, actually, like when I'm doing my own assessment, I have some certain sound. After evaluating the targeted sound, like if I'm assessing for the hypernasality in a single sound, I use the nasal pair. Like I can ask the child to say, Mama, Mima, Nana, Neto, using all the nasal sound, Mama. Nima, Nana, Neto, so that I can be able to assess the nasal sound that is the vowel attached to it. So, okay, thank so you. If so I'm much. going to give them a sentence like this, I said, Mama, Mama na mia, or Mama mi mia. So, this is assessment of that. But if it is for the hypernasality, actually, I can say, Baba ya ba wa biba la bule, meaning I'm using the entire oral sound to make all the sound. I can ask them to say, Baba, Gaga, Dada just to get the hypernasal sound. Thank you so much, Amina. You are welcome. There is another comment here, and um, the attendee is saying, I know Amina has generated vocabulary and sentences in Hausa that can be yes. used for assessment. Yes. So she wasn't sure why you were not using those examples. Well, this is because uh, actually I'm speaking, most of the majority of people listening are actually non houses I thought it's an academic something, so, but I did when you told me that you want uh, a whole thing like a local something, maybe I could have done it, but I was thinking because it's an academic something and everybody here couldn't speak my language, so that is why. Great. Uh, do we have any further questions in the chat room? I don't think so. Uh, just one last question. Are there printable assessment templates available? 
Uh, yes, we have a couple on the Smile Train website. When the link for this session is being sent, we would also include that. So on that note, I want to say thank you again to our presenter, Mrs. Amina Musa. And um, we also appreciate Smile Train team for and the Speech Pathologists and Audiology Association in Nigeria for putting this together. Um, again, we'll be having the final session next week. And that will be by 12 p.m. Nigerian time. 12 p.m. Nigerian time. Please note the change of time. It won't be at 11 a.m. It will be at 12 p.m. Nigerian time on the 27th of May. And um, we also would like to use this opportunity to inform us that there will be a virtual conference with the Speech, and Speech Pathology and Audiologies Association in Nigeria to celebrate the International Month for Speech and Hearing. So I will encourage everyone to tune in again on Thursday, 11 a.m. to be part of the conference. On that note, thank you everyone. Uh, one last question, Amina, if you're still there. I'm here, ma, I'm here, ma. Okay. The question says, considering the influence of individual mother tongue on the intonation of individuals, how does this affect assessment? Well, like I said earlier, Ma, I said this resonance is actually a speech parameter. Stability. Some part of the resonance actually, I said some part of the world have a nasal sound. So if according to that, like people in Philadelphia, they said some of them are nasalized. Well, if in part of our own society, we have people that actually have that type of, I said maybe for familial tendency, or maybe it's an habitual something. So I think you can still make do with it and try to get the possible or near normal sound. Copies. Hello? Thank you so much, I mean, I think we got the question. Uh, so on that note, um, I don't know if Professor Ademo Koya, I've seen he has joined, will want to have a final word and then we can call it a day. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much. It's uh, quite very unfortunate that um, along the night I got cut off, but then um, I'm back. I'd like to congratulate um, Amina for uh, delivery. It's quite very interesting, detailed, and uh, educative paper. Um, lecture. We hope um, there will be opportunity very soon in the future for her to come again and uh, repeat the lecture. So I think, um, yeah, uh, we really thank you very much for that wonderful lecture. And well, as a way of closing, just to remind us again that next week we are starting not exactly by 11 o'clock, but by 12 noon, Nigerian time. And like I've mentioned, we are going to have with us um, Dr. Pamela Shera, you know, and again, um, we also like to remind that we have two programs lined up next week to mark this year International Month of Hearing and Speech. Monday, 20, sorry, Tuesday, 26th, and also Thursday, 28th. On Tuesday, the span will be addressing um, a press conference, you know, and um, Again, we come back on Wednesday to have our normal virtual lecture. And again, we return on Thursday to have the public lecture, you know, that is going to be on this platform too, um, heavily supported by Smile Train. We, we from this one, we acknowledge and appreciate this wonderful partnership. Um, so for the time being, I want to say well, enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, Thank please you. avoid the um, coronavirus. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.